schedule online, anytime. Now you can easily schedule an appointment with Ascension Care Teams at Seton. Find your appointment online, anytime at GetSetonCare.com. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. I'm Corey McClagan. I'm the managing editor of the Texas Tribune, and I'm so happy to welcome you to the eighth annual Texas Tribune Festival and to this panel, How Texas Invented the Artificial Heart. This panel is presented by Ascension Seton and supported by Texas A&M University. Though corporate sponsors and donors underwrite this event, they play no role in determining the panel's content, the panelists, or the line of questioning. This panel will last about an hour and we'll leave 15 or 20 minutes at the end for the audience to ask questions and there will be microphones in the audience. I'm, uh, if you want to tweet, uh, the hashtag is TribFest18. TribFest18 is the hashtag. Um, I'm so honored today to be joined by Mimi Swartz, whose work I have admired for a long time. Mimi is the senior executive editor of Texas Monthly Magazine and an op-ed writer for the New York Times. She's a two-time National Magazine Award winner and is the co-author with Sharon Watkins of the national bestseller Power Failure about Enron. More recently, she's the author of Ticker, The Quest to Create an Artificial Heart. And Mimi will be signing copies of Ticker immediately following this panel at the Festival Hub at 800 Congress. We are also lucky to be joined today by Dr. O.H. Bud Frazier, who's one of the main characters of the book. <laughs> In real life. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Frazier is a renowned, renowned heart surgeon and director of cardiovascular surgery research at Texas Heart Institute in Houston. He's been recognized as a pioneer in the treatment of severe heart failure and heart transplantation performing over 1,200 heart transplants and implanting 900 left ventricular assist devices, which is more than any other surgeon in the world. Dr. Frazier has specialized in total artificial heart implants and in 2011 implanted the first successful continuous flow total artificial heart. Please silence your phones. <laughs> Thank you. This book, um, is a story about innovation. It's a story about a medical moonshot, and it's very much a Texas story. It focuses on the creation of the artificial heart, and there's a lot at stake. Heart disease kills more people around the world than all cancers combined. Tens of thousands of people are on the waiting list for a heart transplant, but there's only about 2,500 hearts available for transplant each year. Ticker raises all sorts of fascinating questions. Should doctors be focusing on prevention instead of an artificial heart? Is a medical innovation worth the expense and effort if it prolongs life for just a few weeks or months? What does it mean to be a human without a pulse? Mimi, let's start with you. Um, why, why, why was this a story that you wanted to tell? Well, because I live in Houston, and uh, a lot of people in Austin don't understand that Houston is a lot more interesting. <laughs> and, hey. and there, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, but I wanted to write about innovation, and uh, I also was fascinated with the people involved, because I'd met Dr. Frazier, I'd met Dr. Cooley, I'd met Dr. DeBakey over time, and realized this was a way to talk about a whole lot of things. You could tell the story of Houston, you could tell the story of these people, and you could talk about innovation as it's done in Houston mm -hmm. over time. Mm -hmm. so. um, and then in terms of um, the artificial heart, um, the way you explained it to me, Mimi, is that while some patients have received artificial hearts, 
What we do not have currently is an artificial heart that works routinely. And so Dr. Fraser, I want to turn to you and I wanted to ask if you can explain um, the status of the development of the artificial heart right now. Well, uh, briefly, how can you? <laughs> we only have an you hour. Know, <laughs> I started working on it as a medical student with Dr. DeBakey in the 60s, and I remember Dr. DeBakey telling me, you know, but by 1980, there'd be 100,000 Americans with artificial hearts, and we can concentrate on cancer and forget about people dying of heart disease. Well, it turned out to be a lot more complicated than he thought. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, in the 80s, I started working on a, a continuous flow pump because the, the problem with, a, with your heart is it beats 100,000 times a day if you do nothing. Mm -hmm. Just do the math, 70 beats a minute, and it turns out to be 100. So the fact that we had a membrane that could flex uh, 100,000 times a minute, uh, a day, I'm sorry, and uh, last 18 months to two years, which is about what they last, mm -hmm. was an accomplishment. But it didn't have any effect on what we would say the epidemiology of heart disease because when it wore out, you would either have to transplant them or the patient would die. So that's why I started working on continuous flow pumps. Uh, there were just two other engineers in the, in the world, I guess, that I could work with. And I worked with them and over the years we've developed it and now we don't even make pulsatile uh, left heart assist devices, what we call. We only make continuous flow and there've been over 50,000 of them implanted in the last meeting I was there was a man from Kazakhstan where they don't really do transplants and he's put it in over a thousand patients. And it's important to realize we never put these in patients that we think are gonna survive to get out of the hospital. None of them are gonna live a year much, or three months. And uh, so the, it's all uh, patients facing imminent death. And in 2009, 11, as you mentioned, we actually replaced the entire heart of a patient. But we'd done that since 2005 in the experimental animal mm -hmm. with the continuous flow pumps. And this Australian, you know, things are done by people. They're not done by committees. Mm -hmm. This Australian whose father died of heart disease and engineering came to us in 2002. Yeah. yeah. And with this wonderful idea of a magnetically suspended pump that didn't touch anything mm -hmm. and could deliver blood to the lungs and to the body. Mm -hmm. Since then, we put it in about 60 experimental animals. And the way it works in the U.S., you, once you finally design, you've reached the design uh, freeze. And we've pretty much reached the design freeze. So then you have to do what they call GLP, it stands for Good Laboratory Practice Studies which we can do in our lab in Houston. And that'll take about a year. So hopefully, uh, you know, I'll see it before I go under, you know, by uh, the late 19 or early 20. We should have it ready for patients. Because we still lose patients from total heart failure, you know. We lose patients on the transplant list that we really could either be, uh, saved by a total heart or rather than a left ventricular assist device or much better served by uh, a total heart replacement. And this is a device called the Bivacor? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And you think pretty soon we could see this? Well, you, you know what I know. <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, we'll start the GLP studies. I think we're, uh, uh, we're pretty set for, to do that by the end of this year or the first of next year. I mean, one of the biggest problems I have is, you know, medicine is not a science, it's an applied art. Mm -hmm. Whereas engineering is a science. Two plus two is always four mm -hmm. to the engineer, but it's not always four in medicine. That's why we deal in statistical survivals. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
And one of the biggest problems I've had in developing all these devices, because all the devices now, these 50,000 pumps that are used around the world, started in my lab. But they, uh, uh, it, it is uh, uh, important that, that uh, we have to you know, work with the engineers and they incessantly you know, think, well, we'll make it a little better this way or a little better that way. Yeah. But I think we will be able to do that okay. in the next year, year and a half. I want to um, take us back in time a little bit. Um, Mimi, I want to ask you to read a, a section from your book. Um, this is from the, page 49, right? Okay, you got it. Okay, uh, this is from Dr. Fraser's time as a young doctor training at Baylor under the legendary Houston heart surgeon. Dr. Michael DeBakey, um, would, you, would you mind reading this for us? Uh, the death toll from that step. and rest that was the best you could do mm -hmm. for a lot of these people who were extremely sick so and then as time went on and people began smoking more uh, in particular that's why the the rates of heart disease went up so high uh, the death toll from heart disease was skyrocketing in 1963 every day another patient at Methodist died because the doctors had so little to offer there was one patient in particular whose terrified, pleading expression would stay with Bud for the rest of his life. He had worked up a medical history for one of DeBakey's growing list of international patients, a 17-year-old Italian boy who was only a few years younger than Bud himself. Med students who did the workup also got to scrub in on the patient's surgery. Bud was there for what he expected to be a routine replacement of a damaged aortic valve. The kid was thin from his illness, but handsome, with dark eyes and thick black hair. Optimistic about the surgery, he was eager to go back home. His mother was with him. The surgery went fine. Bud held and retracted, nothing glamorous, but still exciting for a student. That night, though, the boy's heart stopped. This sometimes happens inexplicably with aortic valve disease. The only way to save the boy was to use a procedure that had first been tried just two years back in 1961, to reopen the chest and manually massage the heart to restart it. A resident cut the boy open again, then turned to the strongest person in the room, Bud. He showed Bud how to reach into the boy's chest and squeeze his heart, mimicking the pumping action of a healthy organ. Around that time, the sedated boy woke up and locked eyes with Bud. The nurses sedated him again, but the boy kept his gaze on Bud and tried to reach for him to hold on. Minutes passed. Bud's hands cramped and the pain began radiating up his arm. He kept going. DeBakey strode in, took one look at the scene, and ordered Bud to stop. Experience told him that too much time had passed and that they were not going to be able to restart the boy's heart. But Bud kept squeezing and releasing until finally a resident had to shove him aside. As soon as Bud let go, the boy slipped away. He could hear the mother sobbing in the waiting room when DeBakey went out to give her the news. As it turned out, that episode would change everything for Bud. If the simple pumping action of his hand could keep someone alive, he figured, there should be some kind of machine that could do it longer and better. It would have to be something a tech could pull off the shelf and the surgeon could implant, a machine that would run almost perpetually inside a human chest, an artificial heart. Thank you. That's such a powerful passage. Um, yeah. um, I didn't, he did it. <laughs> but it's beautiful writing. And um, Dr. Frazier, um, I wanted to ask you what that moment meant for you as a young doctor and what what continues to motivate you today to do this work well i think just as as mimi expressed it it was 
uh, something that I, I felt we should be able to do. You know, we were going to the moon then, and, uh, and of course the artificial heart was already in Dr. DeBakey's mind just a chip shot, you know, and it, and as I said, it turned out to be a lot, lot more of a, a challenge, and uh, I always, uh, you know, uh, remember. Anyway, the uh, the uh, uh, it just it it seems simple at the time. As I said, it turned out to be much more complicated than we thought because not only the durability but the powering and it uh, and we had to change the whole paradigm of how we approach these uh, uh, the problem. Mm -hmm. Um, it seems like her passage really, really takes you back there, doesn't it? Um, Dr. Frazier, I, I want to talk about um, something that's not in the book. Um, uh, you were the focus of reporting by ProPublica in the Houston Chronicle earlier this year. Um, one story has the following headline. A Pioneering Heart Surgeon's Secret History of Research Violations, Conflicts of Interest, and Poor Outcomes. After the story was published, Baylor St. Luke's Medical Center lost Medicare funding for heart transplants. You have sued these news organizations. What was wrong with these stories? Well, they weren't based on any facts at all. They were, you know, I, again, when I got out of Vietnam, actually thought I might go into neurosurgery, but I thought about the boy and I thought I became, you know, I was very depressed. In Vietnam, was, I was in an assault helicopter company in the Central Highlands and we were in active combat. And there was only one other person in the unit, 350 men that had a college degree. Mm -hmm. That was before the lottery system. It was very unfair mm -hmm. because most of the uh, enlisted men were poor boys from mainly from the south and of color and it, it was really uh, unfair but this other other fellow was uh, I, very, I was very close with and he was a, actually he was a journalist he had a journalism degree from UCLA and he got a master's and he would volunteered for the army because he didn't have to go but, but he uh, as sort of a Hemingway experience, and I think one of the things that uh, really bent me toward doing this was I was used to people dying because I'd been in the the uh, uh, Ben Tav ER, and but I wasn't used to someone dying that I just had breakfast with, you know, and I just had breakfast with him, and the next time I saw him, he was dying, yeah. and. Uh, I, I do think that uh, sort of reignited the, the feeling that I'd had with the Italian boy that, mm -hmm. that uh, you know, I just felt like I was lucky to be alive. I'd been shot at. I've seen those. You know, the NVA had green tracers. Mm -hmm. So you always knew when you were being shot at because you'd see the green tracers mm -hmm. coming up and you'd hear them hitting the helicopter. Mm -hmm. So I didn't... Uh, I just felt like, you know, I was just lucky to be alive, and and uh, I just, with what I had with the remainder of my life, to try to do something good and meaningful with my life, mm -hmm. and that's what I've worked for. I've never, I've never even asked what I've been paid. I never ask anything about, uh, you know, my salary. I've just kept working, and and I, uh, the pumps that I've developed or used throughout the world. I just went to a meeting in Zagreb and I got a standing ovation when I walked in the room. And uh, I'm just puzzled. We had trouble with our transplant program. And it was, uh, that's a complicated thing that I don't want to get into. And somebody had called the Houston Chronicle and the troubles were, were legitimate. And I think uh, 
they've been corrected, and I think it's a good uh, a good thing, you know. But I haven't been primarily doing surgery since 2012, and I I consult. I'll go down and help on cases and help uh, on cases because the anatomy of putting in those eleven ventricular assist devices are pretty is pretty complicated. But I had an argument with, and it was a personal argument, it had nothing to do with operations, with the head of the hospital in uh, 2002, 2003. And he was vehemently against me. And he'd hired a, 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 a group from, uh, a lawyer group from New York to come down and, and look at the, the pump, uh, our program. In 2007, we did more of these pumps than anybody in the world, you know, in St. Luke's Hospital. We put in 110. We never had any increase in personnel, so that was one of our, my arguments with him. His argument with me had nothing to do with this. And they wrote up this very negative report, and, and it included it said that I did patients that weren't to be, shouldn't have been done. And, uh, and, and, they didn't even understand that in all these pump studies, you have patients that are exclusions because they look so sick they're not gonna live. So, so the company that makes them, obviously didn't want them included in the study, but it didn't mean you couldn't do them. Mm -hmm. You did a humanitarian device exemption. And the only two things in there, because I never saw it at all. Dr. Cooley went to Dr. Cooley, he took care of it. I found out about it you know, after this guy had already left. And uh, he, uh, uh, but in their report, they said I did a 14-year-old and a 17-year-old, and which was true, I did. And the entry criteria were 18 to 60. But the 14-year-old was dying on a temporary pump, which was an exclusion from the study, but it didn't mean you couldn't do it. And the 17-year-old was the same. The 14-year-old, and they were both died at that time. 14-year-old is 28 now. And the 17 year old's 30. So I, uh, I, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm uh, puzzled more than anything else. I guess the the problem that we had didn't have much to do with me because I, as, as I said, more of a consultant on the transplant service. But, uh, but I guess they thought, well, it's, it's a lot better name to attack. I, you know, who knows? I never never took my name very seriously, or <laughs> well, took my importance very seriously. <laughs> well, we should I say will say, since that started, I've, seen, I've gotten over 100 letters from people <laughs> that I hadn't heard from from years. <laughs> so <laughs> I've had a benefit from that, at least. Uh, <laughs> we but should but say I'm that, puzzled, uh, and, and I'm saddened by it, mm -hmm. you know, because my grandkids get teased, and my mm. family is upset. But, mm. And it has nothing to do with with anything that actually happened. Mm -hmm. they, they just found this report that was supposed to have been a confidential mm -hmm. report. We should say that ProPublica and the Houston Chronicle are standing by their work and they say that they'll uh, defend it vigorously. Yeah, well, they, they don't know anything about the field. Um, well, let's move on. Um, Mimi, going back to the book, you, you share a number of heartbreaking patient stories in the book. Just. Um, for example, Barney Clark's story. Um, people who were around in the early 80s I know, may I'm looking remember at the age. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Clark, uh, who, who got national attention when he received an artificial heart. Uh, he <coughs> lived with it for 112 days, and then he died. What I wanted to ask you was, how have um, high-profile cases like this one presented a challenge for researchers? Well, I, I wouldn't call it a challenge. I thought it was fun. To, when I was starting the Barney Clark part, well, when I proposed doing this book, I talked to my editor, yeah. and I was saying, well, there's, you know, this is a great story because uh, X, yeah. Y, and Z, and then I said, and then, of course, there's the whole Barney Clark story, and my editor, uh, who's around somewhere between 60 and 65, said, well, you don't have to write about Barney Clark. Everybody remembers that, and I, I sort of looked at him, and I was like, no one remembers that anymore. <laughs> Um, so it was really exciting to revisit it yeah. because so many people, does everyone know what, who I'm talking about? You, you have no idea, right? Okay, Barney Clark in 1982 got an artificial heart uh, that, was in, that was invented by a man named Robert Jarvik. 
Um, and it was implanted really. in Utah. And what <laughs> Dr. Fraser is taking issue with that uh, description oh. of who invented yeah. that. Okay, well, you're right. I'm, I'm glossing over. No one really invented anything alone. It's, it's complicated. It's a dirty little yeah. secret here. Um, uh, but I do want to say, I always ask my medical students yeah. who Barney Clark was, I've never heard one that actually knew. Yeah, the time They're is They're getting passed. younger. So, yeah. Um, but anyway, at the t I happened to have been alive and, and of a certain age at that time. So I remembered this story of this man's bravery it was it was one of the first media circuses and and his surgery his implantation was on television all the time i mean people like today were glued to the tv watching this man's progress and it was sort of thought that this was going to be kind of like the moonshot where we were going to see American progress at its best, American research at its best. But unfortunately, Clark, after doing well, started to decline um, very precipitously. And so then you had this horrible media story where everybody was engaged in watching him basically deteriorate on TV every day. And that was a period when it, it was so dramatic and so upsetting for so many people that there was actually uh, an eth a conference of ethical of ethicists and doctors who met to determine what had gone wrong and why they had done this and whether it was a good idea to ever even do this again. So it pretty much stopped. Wouldn't it stop the artificial heart research for a while? 82 to... Well, not, not really. Yeah. I mean, it changed its uh, yeah. format to some degree. Mm -hmm. And we began work, first of all, we tried to work on the a pump. totally implantable yeah. pump, but, but also more uh, effort was made toward the left and toward mm -hmm. the... Mm -hmm. Toward a device. half heart instead of a total replacement. Mm -hmm. Well, that gets a little confusing ah. because <laughs> uh, sometimes all you need is, is one pump. Yeah. And I remember... Yeah. The uh, second patient we did, we put a left ventricular assist device in, and his heart, he developed what we call a stone heart, and, and we saw that in the 70s and 80s, the, the heart would just contract into a ball, and it wouldn't beat at all. We didn't have anything we could do except put a pump in, and uh, the only pump we had was just a half a heart, as you say, mm -hmm. but we put it in, and... Uh, he woke up and he did well. And we, the, the problem was at that time, the immune suppressant drugs that we used for transplantation were so uh, affected the immune system so that these patients died of infections. All the first three patients that got total hearts died of infections from after their transplant. But one of the things that you have to think about, and I've thought about a lot, is the night we put the pump in this young boy, the very night, we'd put it in during the day and he was hanging on. I got a call from the New York Times and they said, Doc, you understand where you put an artificial heart in down there? Yeah. I said, well, not really. It's a left ventricular system. And he said, well, that's, it's an artificial heart. We can call it an artificial heart. <laughs> and I said, no. You can call it a, a left ventricular assist device from the ventricular apex through the retrocolic gutter <laughs> into the distal abdominal aorta powered by an external pneumatic control. You can call it, he said, I can't call it an artificial heart. I said, no, but you, you don't need to talk about the retrocolic gutter. I don't think that's important. <laughs> and, and then he said, Good luck, Doc. <laughs> That's the last I'd heard of him. And, and it is a bit of a, uh, you know, Dr. DeBakey introduced the term artificial heart. It's never been an artificial heart, total artificial heart. We replaced the lower two chambers, but not the upper chambers. And we use those for conduits. And I've always thought one reason we were able to develop the left ventricular assist device because all the initial left ventricular assist device patients died. And then it took a, a lot of work and a lot of courage and, uh, uh, from the patients as well. And, uh, and we, uh, 
But I don't think if we'd called it an artificial heart, we could have withstood that, you know. <laughs> and uh, so it's an interesting sociological mm -hmm. phenomenon. Dr. Frazier, when you started talking about the idea of a pump that would push blood through the body with a spinning action instead of a, a pulsing, uh, people thought you were crazy. Um, don't, <laughs> don't we have to have a pulse to be human? I don't think so. I've got a patient now that's been out 14 years without a pulse, and he's doing very well, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and he, uh, I, I, it, the, the, the problem was the durability, mm -hmm. and we still haven't improved membranes enough that will last any meaningful length of time. But we have patients out, as I said, over 14 years. There's over 100 patients out now over 10 years mm -hmm. with an artificial, with just an ventricular cystified. And uh -huh. these are continuous flow pumps. Okay. And uh, so it is, and they don't have a pulse. Most of them don't have a pulse. If you try to feel a pulse, it's, it's a little frightening, particularly to those that aren't familiar with it. I remember one of our early patients, a young man from Alabama that was sent down to us because they didn't want to operate on Alabama. Then they sent him to Vanderbilt. They didn't want to do anything there. He was too sick. So he comes down. We put a pump in him. and. He goes back to uh, Alabama, and he was he's bending over, helping his mother do something on on the floor, and his heart fibrillated, and he felt a little dizzy, but he was otherwise all right because the pump was keeping him alive, and he felt like he should go to the emergency room, and uh, so his mother took him to the emergency room, and the doctor there did an EKG on him, and the EKG showed the heart was fibrillating, which means you're dead. And he tried to get a blood pressure. Since he didn't have a pulse, you couldn't, couldn't get a blood pressure with a blood pressure cuff. So he didn't have a blood pressure, and he was sitting there talking to him, telling his jokes. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and this doctor called me from the emergency room in, in uh, I think it was uh, Atlanta, actually. and. Uh, he said, I, you know, I think I'm in a scene from the Twilight Zone. <laughs> <laughs> this kid is dead. I said, no, he's not. He's fine. Yeah. Just shock the heart. Uh, it, it works better if the heart's beating. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. But it is. But it was a new physiology. Yeah. And it, it took a lot of adjusting by the mm -hmm. physician. But this is in the book. I mean, it's a controversial idea, right? The, the idea of not having a... I, I think it's what, like Dr. Fraser told me this story very early on when when people were trying to fly, you know, everybody we yes. wanted to get up into the air and we couldn't really get there by trying to flap like a bird. Somebody uh -huh. had to come up with a different idea. Yeah. And I think you can't replace the with these pulsatile pumps. They only last two years or that's you know, outside, they wear out. So mm -hmm. then you're back in surgery again. Mm -hmm. But with the rotary pumps, they, as Dr. Frazier said, they haven't pumped to failure. So mm -hmm. they're, they're in the... There's hmm? no mechanical failures yeah. to, to date. But uh, but again, it's another thing. It's, it's enough for all of us to sit around and talk about these things because we're well, mm -hmm. you know? Yeah. But, uh, you know, as, particularly as you get older, you wonder how you're going to get out of the world, but one of the worst ways to get out is uh, heart failure, because it's basically a slow suffocation, and it's a horrible death, and, uh, and that always impacted me. And the, and the uh, rates are going up. I mean, we should say heart attacks yeah, are going down, but heart failure heart, rates are going up. Heart failure is going up, and it is something that is nice to discuss when you're healthy, but if the first thing every patient says to me, literally everyone from the heart transplants to the LVADs, when they sort of recover from the operation, they say, I can breathe again, mm. I can breathe. Mm. Yeah. Um, Mimi, can you tell us a little bit about just what it was like to research this book and, <laughs> and the process that you went yeah. through? Yeah. Well, I keep meaning to bring a visual aid. Uh, it's so embarrassing to say in front of Dr. Fraser, but I learned this from my husband, whose motto is dare to be stupid. I, uh, <laughs> I bought children's books, you know, this is your heart, because it was the, my, no, I was not a biology major in, 
uh, and so I had to learn from the ground up. But I was fortunate in that uh, I would say trial lawyers mostly are more accessible than a lot of surgeons. <laughs> But Dr. Fraser was really generous with his time and, and letting me ask really dumb questions. Um, and it was, you know, the, once I started to learn the terminology, then I knew where to go. So you, you know, it's like any story, I think, where you start with people who have a lot of tolerance for you and move. My interview with Dr. Jarvik, uh, it still remains one of the most, uh, embarrassing situations. I just didn't know how to talk to him. Maybe nobody does. <laughs> yeah. um, a bit of a but, challenge. Yeah. Um, but, you know, you, it, it's hard because it's very technical. I thought yeah. this book would be easier than, than Enron, which I wrote about before. It was yeah. not. It was, yeah. this was Jarvik's hard. wife is, has the highest IQ in the world. Or so she and says. So, yeah. so she says. Yeah. But, uh, but I, one of the things that I've often thought about is I was an English history major at mm -hmm. UT, and uh, I didn't know what I was going to do. My mother was 40 when I was born. She was more like having a grandmother, anything you want to do. And, you know, my father was injured, a bit in World War II. I had very little guidance. And mm -hmm. I had to, you know, when I went to the University of Texas, you eventually had to get out. You know, you couldn't oh. just <laughs> stay in it indefinitely. Yeah. And, <laughs> no. and uh, I started reading a, uh, a Chekhov, uh, the doctor's stories of Chekhov, and I thought, well, maybe it'd be nice to be a doctor. I'd never taken a pre-med course, so I had to take them all in one year, which is impossible to do today. And I had 170 undergraduate hours. You needed 120 to graduate. <laughs> and uh, so all the extra courses I took, but I'm often thought about that, that because literally nobody had any in the field, the clinicians had any uh, faith in the continuous flow pump, and they could cite all the physiologic reasons why it it wouldn't work. And uh, I had dinner with this uh, Irish singer not too long ago. Uh, Bono, Bono, yeah. Bono, Bono. I've heard of him, yeah. yeah. Anyway, nice guy. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> oh, yeah, he's a very nice guy. And I had dinner with him, and we spent the whole evening talking about the fact that he either had no music lessons or very few, and the other two, two of his other members of his band had no, the only one that had music lessons is the, is the guitarist, who has, he's got another nickname too, he's a nice guy. Yeah. Edge, yeah, Edge, because he's got a sharp nose, and Bono called him the Edge. And, but I think, you know, we discussed the fact that it, uh, because I wasn't so bound to the history of biology that maybe I could look at it a little differently. And uh, he thought one of the reasons that he's been successful in his tunes, you know, singing, and uh, is because... Uh, he didn't have enough music education to tell him he couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have a, enough biological education to know I couldn't do it. And, and, but I knew we had to do something, otherwise we were, never, we were at a dead end. Mm -hmm. um, Mimi, in your book, there's a number of things that I think uh, Texas readers will be especially interested in, and uh, Houston readers in particular. How, how did this uh, furniture salesman, Mattress oh. Mac, uh, Matt? Mac, Mac, sorry, Mac, uh, yeah. figure into this story? Well, uh, in DeBakey's time, um, the government funded a lot of research. And over time, that's changed to where now you've got things like hedge funds uh, supporting medical research. And hedge funds have a shorter uh, attention span. So, you know, one of the stories in the book has to do with the fabulous invention that ended up on the junk heap because the investors got sick of waiting and, you know, pulled out. So with this heart, uh, with the Bivacor, which is the main character, I guess, in the book, um, this young man from Australia came with this invention and they had to get funding. And this is the Tim's. This is a, a young man named Fraser Daniel Tim's from Australia. His father and 
-hmm. Yes, whose father died of heart disease. And um, they had to find their funding somewhere. And as often happened, um, Dr. Frazier and, and a colleague, Dr. Cohn, had operated on Mattress Mac's brother, who was very sick with heart disease and eventually died of it. And so uh, Dr. Billy Cohn, when, when he knew they were going to have to get money for Daniel Tim's invention to research it, Dr. Cohn got in his, what is he driving? It's a very fancy car. Yeah. Went up the highway I to this. Mac something. Yeah, yeah. This enormous sprawling furniture store that looks kind of like a bunch of circus tents put together and went in and talked to Mac and showed him this device. And then Mac came down to the Texas Heart Institute. Uh, looking for funding and uh, I mean to see demonstrations of uh, this device and he and his wife wrote a check on the spot for two million dollars so they could create a lab and that to me is sort of the classic Houston story really too, yeah. where you don't have to go through a whole lot of channels somebody's just there I mean they need much more money to, mm -hmm. to bring this device to market but mm -hmm. I think starting that way seemed to me I mean Cooley had so many friends who underwrote his business mm -hmm. um, and it's sort of the Houston way. Yeah. What what is the funding situation like now, Dr. Frazier? Well, it's uh, you know it's good to have these private investors, but no matter who they are, no matter how well meaning they are, they eventually want to make some money, mm -hmm. and uh, we have more people wanting to invest in it than we can actually take their money. Mm -hmm because Mac doesn't want us to. And, and, and I'll have to say that he's given more money than that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know how you can make so much money selling mattresses, but somehow he, he's done it. And, uh, and he, uh, he continues to say, it doesn't really matter, you know, mm -hmm. let me know if you need money. And, and he also but, saved the day after the hurricane last year, right? Yeah. <laughs> he, People He's a wonderful man. I, I don't, you know, <laughs> yeah. as I said, I, I don't know how he's made the money. I'm sure it's legitimate money, but <laughs> <laughs> it's just hard to imagine. But, but he's, uh, he's been more than generous. And the good thing about it, because if you really just go into venture capital, because a lot of these early pumps that were the groundwork for the, the continuous flow pumps uh, were funded by venture capital capitalists and, and, and they pulled out when mm -hmm. they couldn't see an immediate uh, uh, benefit. And, but I will say that NIH spent over a billion dollars developing postal pumps mm -hmm. and po postal LVADs. Mm -hmm. And I developed the first one that was approved by the FDA and, and, uh, in 94. In, uh, but none of them are even made today. Mm -hmm. None of them are used today. Mm -hmm. I want to give the audience a chance to ask some questions. Where is the mic? Okay, you have it. It's in the back. Who wants to ask a question? There's one here and one here. Do you, either one? Just. No, no, no. She's going to bring it to you. Keep the mic around if you would, because I think they're going to maybe fix okay. it in the back. But I, I mean, keep it in front of your mouth if you would. Yeah, I think eventually, it'll, eventually it'll work. So I was wondering, and I've heard about this continuous flow, and it sounds very interesting. And so I was wondering, um, so does the continuous flow system oxygenate the blood as well as my heart does right now? And what about when you're exercising? Does it somehow speed up so you get more oxygen in your blood? OK, and let's it, let's take that question. Do you, oh, no, it's not <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. 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 Go ahead. Um, and is it less strenuous on your tissues to have something like that, that doesn't have the constant beating, and and does the blood come back as well? To your okay. Okay. That's a four-part question. Okay. Got it. Um, Dr. Fraser. Well, the circulation is intact. It just makes a circle. The only organ that actually really needs a pulse is the heart. And it needs it 
for what we call systole when it pumps, uh, it ejects the blood and then it relaxes and then that's when the heart receives its blood. But if you look at circulation, this is something I, I learned from embryology looking at chicken's eggs and the blood at a capillary level is constant. The flow is constant. There's no pulsatility to it. So it's only the heart that uh, actually uh, needs a pulse. And one of the things, and stop me if I guess this gets too far out, but one of the things that uh, tempted me to look at continuous flow was we developed also the first totally implantable postal artificial heart that was powered with nothing coming through the skin. It's powered uh, Tesla, you know, with transcutaneous power, which we can do now. We could always do that. But uh, the, uh, uh, the problem is there's a right side of your heart pumps to the lungs and the left side pumps to the body. And they don't pump the same amount of blood. The left side gets the blood that goes from the bronchial arteries. I always ask the medical students this. They don't know. The cardiologists don't know it. And because uh, you, the, to oxygenate the lungs themselves, it comes from the bronchial arteries. But there are no bronchial veins because the blood from the lung goes directly to the left ventricle through the pulmonary veins. So with each heartbeat in all of us here today, adults, there's about one cc more on the left side than on the right side. Now, that doesn't sound like much, but 100,000 times in 24 hours, you, it's 100,000 cc's. So it, it's impossible without adjusting for that. And the adjusting adjustments that were made in the postal heart only worked for a limited amount of time. That was another reason we gave up uh, on the postal pumps, or I gave up on them. But if you have a continuous flow pump, and, and I, I don't know more about this than you, but an engi any engineer can tell you that if you have a pump, say, that's spinning at 10,000 RPM, and the inflow is at a level of five centimeters of pressure, and it pumps 10 liters, let us say, just, these are just arbitrary numbers out there, but if you double the amount of the inflow pressure, it will respond without changing the RPM and flow 30% uh, more. And we've already demonstrated that in our calves. We put them on a treadmill and the calf's heart, the calf requires a lot more blood than the human, but it'll be pumping about 11 liters a minute while they're not doing anything and they start walking and it goes up to 15 liters without changing the RPM. And, and as I said, this is something fluid engineers will know, probably the day-to-day -day engineer would never pay any attention to it. But uh, I somehow had picked that up along the line that the inflow pressure could balance the left and the right side. So in this pump they're working on now, it just has one moving part it's not uh, uh, connected to anything. It's spinning by, there's uh, 22,000 data points a second with the computer tells it exactly where it should be according to how much blood it will pump. Now, you know, so if you exercise and more blood comes back to your heart, then it changes and it will pump more. And of course, I, I didn't believe this. Which your normal heart does all the time. Yeah, your your but normal no, heart. No, no device yeah. had ever been yeah, able yeah. to do that until and, this one. And mm. he, so. you're sitting there, your heart can't pump any more than it's pumping. Mm. Not, but you go outside and you walk up a couple of flights of stairs, it will respond. And this pump will too. Mm. Now, uh, and, and that's one of the appealing things because mm. it's small. We put it in a four-year-old child, continuous flow pumps in. And uh, and they've uh, uh, so it'll it'll fit in, in, in the bulk of the population. Mm -hmm. We don't have an infant pump yet, but we can make one. I think you know there's something that I I thought about while I was working on this book, and I uh, somebody a friend I drove over with today is that in the in the 
late 50s, early 60s, even throughout the 70s, I think the country had this sense of wonder about what we could invent and how we could really change people's lives. And part of the book, I think, was sort of discovering how, in a way, I mean, you all are sitting here going, wow, that's kind of cool. But most people, you know, they really, they're involved with the Kardashians now. And I think <laughs> that was a question. It was really a serious question I had where, you know, our sense of wonder has sort of been tamped down for some at something like this, which is anybody, I mean, when I, I got to watch a lot of these implantations, and it's, you walk into a lab and you see a calf, that looks like an ordinary calf, except for tubes and wires. And, and you realize, you know, you put your, uh, Daniel Timms let me use a stethoscope, and instead of hearing lub dub, lub dub, you hear this And it's like going to the moon. So. Mm. Mm. Well, as long as you're healthy, you don't worry about that. Yeah, thing. yeah, I, I think that's If you have right. a child dying of heart failure, yeah. if you have a, a loved one dying uh -huh. of heart failure, it becomes a different, yeah. and we lose about, uh, and depending on which statistic you look at, 50,000 or so a year in America that could benefit by mm -hmm. this. And as I said, in Kazakhstan, they've already put in over a thousand of these continuous mm -hmm. flow pumps that are for dying patients mm -hmm. and that uh, wouldn't have lived otherwise. Let's go to this next question here. What happened to the microphone? It died. Just holler. Yeah. Okay. Where is stem cell where research? Where is stem cell, cell research going to create an, uh, an actual heart for people? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, again, I'll try to <laughs> try to phrase it. I, we've actually we worked with a, 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 a woman, a good friend of mine, who's developed a way of decellularizing a mouse heart and putting it in a rat washing all the cells away so that the only thing left is a superstructure. And he put it in another experimental animal and it will actually beat. Mm -hmm. But it's a Peter Pan beat. You know, you've got to believe, you've got to believe, you've got to look at it. <laughs> you've got to look at it a long time and you can see it's moving. But it has cells and the cells, uh, you know, Use can almost change the stamp of nature, as Hamlet says. And it changes the stamp of nature and the cells that are circulating in the blood, that are blood cells, there are no muscle cells in the blood, somehow realize that if they're going to be stuck in this little cellularless heart, they've got to change into a myocyte. Now that's a very important observation. Uh, I'm sorry, that's right, I missed that. It, a muscle cell that contracts, whether it was just a blood cell that carried oxygen. And we've tried to do that in experimental animals. I've been working with her a long time, and we've taken pig hearts, and we've put them in calves, but we've not been able to duplicate that in anything but the, the mice. And I, I really think it needs a, a really meaningful NIH funding and NIH support because most of the support has come from, frankly, rich old men that want to be young again, it looks like to me. I mean, and they've spent like $3 billion in California alone on stem cell research, but it's all come from private funding. And I, it's a lot better, the NIH funding, because it has a lot of scrutiny of a lot of different people and, and they've got to really show some progress. And I think you, you don't decide whether something will work or not if you're trying to, to work on them. As Claude Bernard said in the 1700s, you decide whether the experiment is worth it, if you should do the experiment. And I certainly believe the experiment is worth it, and I wish it were better funded or, or more uh, equitably funded than it is today. Mm -hmm. You know, I get very discouraged by that. I, I'm working on the, I'm the, working on this total heart, and I'm working on a very small pump, and this will have more impact. I'm, I'm sure I won't 
live to see this, because this will probably be five years or so, before, that you can put in through the subclavian vein, and it's the size of my little finger, smaller, and put it into the left side of the heart, and then bring it out and put it into the subclavian artery. So you can put it in an earlier heart failure patient when the heart can still recover, because the heart, when rested, recovers from heart failure. But we usually wait so long before we try to try to impact that. And it's open heart surgery. You have to open the chest. This you don't have to open the chest. And there's a young man who actually is an Aggie to, who is very dedicated and, and working on it. And, and uh, there's a young woman working with him. And, and Daniel Timms, the, the woman is from China. And uh, Daniel Tim is from Australia. But I don't see any young surgeons that are in their 30s and 40s working to try to make an artificial heart or trying to do cases and send bills. I've never sent a bill. I don't even know how things are billed. But if you start worrying about that, you're not going to do anything. Not that they're good doctors and they take good care of their patients, but to do something innovative, you have to think a bit outside the box. Well, about, I'm just going to repeat the question. Tell us about the evolution of regulation for these devices. I think it's being recorded. So. Does it stymie, regulate, uh, stymie innovation? Well, I, the, re the regulation, you know, was it Plutarch said things never move together, move forward in a straight line. They go this way and they go that way. And in, in one of his stories, I think he's, uh, I've forgotten who he was t which one he was talking about in of his lives. He said it's like a ship tacking against the wind. And what happened, and I, you know, God rest him, God bless him, Dr. Cooley and Dr. Wada in the 70s began putting in a valve in that opened like a toilet seat, like this. And but prior to that, the only heart valve was a ball valve. And the ball was still in the in the bloodstream, so it was obstructive in itself. <laughs> and that's you know, Dr. Cooley was the master surgeon. There'll never be anyone alive who can fly that little Spirit of St. Louis across the Atlantic, and there's nobody alive that can do twelve or fourteen cases like Dr. Cooley would do in a day. He was a master surgeon, so he got a lot of these valve cases. But this idea of a uh, one opening like a as I said, like a toilet seat, it was a good one because there was less obstruction. And Dr. Cooley started putting them in, he put them in. When I was with him, he would put in over 100. But guess what? After about six months, it popped out. And of course, it was mortal to the patients. And the, the Cutter Company, it's called a Cutter Water Valve. You can look, look it up because the Cutter Company had to declare bankruptcy. And an and a legislator from Pennsylvania looked into it and he realized that nobody had ever studied it. If you'd put it in a calf, the calf has a hyperdynamic heart, it would have popped it out in two weeks and they would have known it wouldn't work. And that's where the, it's food and drug administration. It doesn't have anything to do with devices. And I've been through it with all those people. And of course, they didn't want to do it. They were doing enough anyway, but they were the only agency that could actually, uh, the government had to enforce this. And that's how it started. You know, it went too far this way. And I think, and I, mean, I know all these people well with the FDA after through the years, but they're well-meaning, good people that want to do what's right. And they want to not impede progress, but they also want to make sure we don't have any more cut or water valves. Because, uh, you know, what's that great line in the, 
the Godfather, I never ask who shot Mo Green. After all, business is business, you know. You can't, you can't just depend on business. I mean, you have to ultimately, but so I, I, it's a long-winded answer, which I'm famous for. But I, th I think we need, we need the FDA. We need some regulation and oversight. But I, I do wonder, the most commonly used pump today is an intraortic balloon pump. I don't know if you all know what that is, but it's just a pump they put in through the femoral artery and it goes up into the descending aorta and it relieves the pressure that the heart has to pump again. And it's a very good pump. And there's, you know, 50, 60,000 used in the U.S. every year. The first 35 patients we put it in all died. And they didn't die because the pump didn't work. It's just like a lot of things, they died because they didn't try it until the patient was already so sick. No matter what you did, it would fail. The same was true in the early chemotherapy, with the, particularly with children, and, uh, and they fell under a lot of criticism as well. So I do think certainly uh, it's something we can reflect on, but the reality is today we do have to address it. And every pump that I've developed, I've done through the FDA, and I've worked with them, and I've, uh, you know, I want to make sure that, that just like they do, that it's going to be a benefit but it is, uh, it does add to the expense and the complications. And I think that's one of the beauties, as I said, of having the NIH involved is they could well, undergird the support. I'm sorry to interrupt. I think we're out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> but um, thank you both so much for being thank here. And remember to come join Mimi for um, the book signing at 800 Congress. So thank you. Thank you all.